The reading today is taken from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in a boat with the hired men and followed him. Thanks to those who um, pre-recorded um, the readings and um, the prayers. Jess and Emily are right here. That must have been a little bit weird watching yourselves, but it's so that we don't have to share microphones and all that stuff. So thank you for doing that. I wonder what you think church is. It's been a crazy six months where we've not been allowed to meet in church. Uh, worship has been online and uh, we've been sharing with, with people just in our bubbles or within our households. So is church an activity that we do? Is church a building? Is church a community? Is church mission? Well, I would argue that ultimately church is a community of people centered around Jesus. People moving towards Jesus from wherever they might be in life. You may be far away from Jesus, but you're still moving towards him. You may be really close to Jesus, but you're still moving towards him. And over the summer... I've been asking the Lord, you know, what can we speak about through this term? What, what do we need to recapture as a church community? And I would argue that the phrase that I feel like the Lord's put on my heart helps us work out how we do church, whether we're watching online, whether we're sitting in a room or whether we're out in the middle of the week doing our normal job. This phrase the Lord has really spoken into my heart is that we would become a community of radical disciples of Jesus. Because if church is a community of people gathered around Jesus, then it's a community. It's us doing it together. And it's us learning what it means to be disciples when Jesus called his first disciples, it was an invitation. Come, follow me. John Mark Comer, many of you read or listen to him. He calls our Christian life an apprenticeship to Jesus. And I love that phrase. Because an apprentice comes along and watch someone who knows a little bit more about what it is that they're doing than the apprentice does. And they model what it is that they're doing based on what the master does. If you're an apprentice, you have a master or a teacher. And you look at what they do and then you try and do the same. And that's what it means for us to try to follow Jesus. To look at what he did and try to do the same. I've been helping Daisy practice her driving in between her lessons. So she started uh, driving uh, last year and obviously through lockdown, it wasn't particularly easy. But we're getting back in the car uh, and trying to help her get practice for whenever she might be able to get a driving test. And one of the things that's really struck me is how hard it is for me to explain how to do something that's just obvious and natural to me because I've been driving for so many years to somebody who doesn't know and it turns out that when I was explaining some things I actually told her how to do it wrong and I was like no 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 actually I didn't mean that I've just thought about it you need to do this instead. Daisy is trying to practice the skills of learning how to drive and it means that it's quite hard for her there's a lot of thought going into it it doesn't all come naturally. Whereas when I get behind the seat of a uh, driving wheel, 
It's all natural because I've been practicing, I've been doing it for many years. And the, the point of Daisy practicing is that it becomes natural to her as well. So when we're learning how to do something, where we're becoming an apprentice, it means that we're doing some things that feel a little bit awkward to start with, but then become kind of natural afterwards. And that is what the path of discipleship is like with Jesus. So over this next season, I want us to consider some tools for discipleship. Just like learning to drive, it can feel clunky to start with, but they become more natural over time. And over this next season, we're going to learn about how to learn and grow as we seek first God's kingdom. Uh, We're going to learn how to get a good rhythm of life, or at least the theory behind it. We're going to learn how to try to balance relationships and live a three-dimensional life. We're going to learn how to grow in the gifts that God has given to us. Not just from when we meet here in church, but so that we can be the disciples of Jesus through the week, and whatever it is that we find ourselves doing. But in all this, we have to remember that the tools are not the point. When I was building the deck that's around the back of our house, I was using my power saw, and I was using my drill to drill in at the holes and to screw the screws down. But the point wasn't the tools, the point was the deck, The point as we go through these tools over the next few weeks is to remember it's not that we are trying to gain God's favour, but it's that we already have God's favour. And so we're trying to use the tools that we can to live our lives more consistent with the way that he wants us to live than the way that we were living. The point of me building a deck wasn't just to use the tools, although that was quite fun because they're power tools. The point was to build a deck. The point of using these tools isn't so that we can feel better about ourselves. It's so that we can begin to live a life more like Jesus. Jesus is inviting us to follow him. But in Matthew chapter 7, he makes it really clear that following him is not an easy option. Matthew 7, 13 to 14, Jesus says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. We often give people the opportunity to make the first decision to follow Jesus. And it's exciting when people do that. It's that moment in someone's life when they take a huge step away from the things that they were doing and towards life, away from what Jesus called that broad path that leads to destruction and into the narrow path that leads to life. That first decision to follow Jesus often feels like a crossroads or a fork in the road. We have to choose one way or another. Am I going to carry on going my way or am I going to start going the way of Jesus? But the truth is that Jesus invites us not to just go through the gate, but to walk along the path. It's not just a one-off decision. It's then that we begin to walk the path that Jesus has for us. It's an invitation to follow him. And I really want us to remember this through this next season. It's all about grace. It's why I started with that reading from Romans. To remind us that Jesus has done all that we need to have done for us so that we can walk this path. We're not walking the narrow path to try to achieve uh, eternal life. Life in all its fullness. We're trying to walk the narrow path because it's been given to us already in Jesus. You could argue that the cross is actually the key to the gate itself. The cross of Jesus is what allows us to have the invitation. It's what allows us to have the welcome of the Father to enter through the narrow gate. But what comes after the narrow gate is the narrow path. 
You see, Paul reminded the church that he planted in Ephesus this point. He said, it's by grace you have been saved, through faith. And that's not from yourselves. It's a gift from God, so that it's not by works, so that nobody can boast. Nobody can say, oh, I'm a better Christian than you because God loves me more than you. No, he doesn't. He loves us all equally. He sent Jesus to die for each one of us. And our response to that great love is to seek to walk and follow Jesus along that narrow path. A few years ago, our family was on holiday in Cornwall in the summer and I had taken my OS map. Now, I love OS maps. I don't know about you, but I love a good map and I love being able to work out where we are and what the contours are like and this, that and the other. And we'd worked out a simple walk from our campsite to the local town so that we could have a cream tea because every time we go to Cornwall, Lizzie loves a cream tea. So we went to uh, along this walk and I had planned it using my OS map. Uh, And it meant that we went along this beautiful coastal path, but then we ended up going through a field of cows and to be honest they have very big horns and looked very very scary and we managed to convince ourselves in the first few steps that they were all bulls so in our minds we were walking through this field of bulls and it was terrifying so we we're walking as quickly don't look at them in the eye don't look them in the eye keep walking and we got through the field thank the lord we managed to walk another two miles to get to this uh, town where we couldn't find a cream tea and we found out that the buses weren't running So having taken our small children on a short walk, well, three mile walk to the town, we then had to go back. But don't worry, I had my OS map and I'd worked out a different route home that was going to be quicker. The problem was this route home that was quicker was along a main road, which in Cornwall has uh, very rocky sides and they're very thin roads and cars drive at about 40 miles an hour around blind corners. And so there we are walking our family along this treacherous road. But I'm like, if we just keep going, we can get to this path that's marked on my map. And so along what felt like a deadly road, it would have been if we weren't lucky. So I was walking, trying to make sure the cars all knew and everyone was frustrated because this family was walking along this road. We got finally to this path. Thank you, Jesus. We turned onto it. And it was very, very clear that we were the first people to have used this path in years. It was not a well-trodden path. Uh, We walked along and got to a stile at the end of the field between one field and another. And it was covered in stinging nettles. Now, I was wearing shorts and my kids were about this high. And so we were like, what are we going to do? Do we turn around and go back and walk along the treacherous road to get back to the campsite? Or do we try and go forward through the stinging nettles? And I did what I could, the only thing I could think to do, which was to pull my shorts down over my lower legs and then try and trample all the stinging nettles so that the kids wouldn't get stung from them. And they were in stitches because they could see my boxes, but there I was trampling down these stinging nettles. When I think of the narrow path, I think of that path that we walked through. We managed to get over the stile and into a slightly better path and managed to get home eventually. When I think of the narrow path, that's what I think of. It's not an easy path to walk along. And Jesus is clear when he invites us to follow him that it's not going to be easy. We talked about the cross being like the key to the padlock or the key to the gate that allows us onto the path. But Jesus also said that it's the steps that we take along the path too. In Matthew 16, he tells his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is what Jesus did for us. He took up his cross, walked through Jerusalem, having been condemned to death, having done nothing worthy of it, so that he could give his life for us. And when we think of the hardship of walking the narrow path, what we have to remember is that Jesus has already gone there first. He's already done it for us, and he invites us to do it with us. 
Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. The cross is not just the key to the padlock. It's also the key to each step we take along the narrow path. I've said a few times before, whoops, that our culture teaches us that fullness of life and freedom is being able to say yes to whatever we want. Our culture is built around individualism and around self-fulfillment. And yet the journey of discipleship is built around community and self-denial. Do you hear that? Culture says you find fulfillment through individualism, doing what you want, and self-fulfillment. Jesus says, following me is through doing it with one another in community and through self-denial. Culture says, do whatever you want and you'll find happiness. Don't be restricted in anything you do or think because that will limit your self-actualization. Express yourself however you want in terms of your money, what you do with your sex life, your preferences, your choices, your time. Do whatever you want and you'll be free. It's the promise of our culture. But Jesus says that's a broad road which leads to destruction and we see all around us, don't we? Rising depression, anxiety, suicide. The atomization of our society where we've been more connected than ever but more lonely than ever. People trapped in all sorts of ways. Lives destroyed by appetites to which people say yes. You see, I would argue that whatever we say yes to is what we worship. Instead, Jesus invites us to the narrow path, not to self-fulfillment, but self-denial. The freedom in Jesus allows us not just to say yes to whatever we want, but actually to say no and find freedom by being able to say no. Paul writes in Romans 8, 15, if you live in accordance with the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Becoming a community of radical disciples of Jesus will mean us learning to say yes to the spirit and no to the things of the flesh. It will mean taking up our cross and following Jesus. And it's not going to be an easy journey. Jesus has already told us that. And maybe some of us have found COVID particularly hard. Well, following Jesus is a hard, narrow path as well. But the scriptures, Jesus teaches us that it's the path that leads to life. It's an adventure with Jesus where we see him do what he has promised for us as we seek to follow him along this narrow path. So whatever we say yes to is what we worship. And if we're going to become a community of radical disciples of Jesus... And we need to learn to use these tools that he's given us. And it might feel clunky at the beginning, but it'll feel easier as we get used to using them. Jesus is inviting us on a journey with him to learn from him. And we can't do it without the Holy Spirit's help, right? It's like having a power tool without it being plugged in. My saw or my drill would have been no use building my deck if I hadn't plugged it in. And the Holy Spirit is that power source that helps us use these tools that we've been given 
to begin to walk more faithfully this radical path of discipleship. Jesus is inviting us to go on an adventure with him, to love and serve him and each other and greater Manchester and beyond. That's what it means to be part of our church community. And he's inviting us in this new season to become a community of radical disciples of Jesus, saying, Jesus, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live my life? How can I give my yes to you? To give him my yes is to love him, heart, soul, mind and strength. But you might be thinking, just as I think when I hear someone preach this kind of thing, can I trust Jesus? Can I trust him? Can I walk this narrow path and know that he's going to meet me? Well, I want to read you a post from one of my friends who lives in Southern California. She was on my team of worship leaders 12 years ago uh, when we were living and I was working in the States. And she's been learning how to live this life of being a radical disciple of Jesus. And she put this post online. They've been going on holiday, her and her family, uh, uh, for the last week or two weeks or so to Yosemite National Park. Lizzie and I went there two years ago with the kids, and it's absolutely beautiful. And you look and you see the Instagram post, and you're like, oh my goodness, aren't they just living the best life? Well, she wrote this, along with this photo. People have always told my mothering ears that ages four to 12 are like magical golden years for family trips. Chris, that's her husband, and I have tried dozens of times to build a vacation fund for such years, but we kept leaning into a life of giving our money to Jesus and obeying his wild ideas for our budget. We're no strangers to sacrifice, but neither to miracles and always having enough. So all three of our kids are entering this age range and I can feel my value of these experiences stirring. Then boom, Chris's cousin reached out to us with a free pre-booked condo in Bass Lake Yosemite for a week. What? Then a neighbor lent us a kayak and someone in our missional community gave us some spending money. Then in a short time, we had everything lined up for a fun family trip that I didn't even have to plan. Hallelujah. We had an amazing week of hiking, fishing, boating, tubing, kayaking, exploring, grilling, playing, laughing, learning in a new place. We had devotions together every morning, dinner together most nights and games, spiritual conversations and encouragement. Their family helped tremendously with our boys and they adopted us as the true family. We got to pray and prophesy over more than 40 people through the week up there and see people touched by God. So many gifts. I want to share this because God is asking some of you to risk security and financial gain for the sake of relationships, his kingdom, something he's put in your heart to do. He wants you to give up your way for his way, your own smaller ideas and visions of how to attain your ideals of what things should look like. He's doing this with me over and over, she writes. It's because I forget that he is in a good mood that he designed me, put those hopes in my heart and delights in giving them to me in his better, grander, more faith-filled way. Seek first his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Chasing after him, sacrificing for him is the surefire way to receive both provision and superior things like relationships and partnership with God on earth, living out the purposes and plans he designed for you. You're in for a wild ride. He didn't happen to put an inkling of adventure in your spirit, did he? And thanking him for what he's already given you is the secure road to walk along into the unknown. Remembering what he's done are like glasses that help you see clearly. Gratitude with obedience is the key that unlocks miracles. Read in the Bible about all people who took big risks for God and how he came through for them. I'm living proof, she says. I've got hundreds of more stories. What kind of adventure is God calling you into? That's the invitation, to follow Jesus, 
The one who loves us so much he gave his own life for us. The one who invites us onto the narrow road that yes, it might be hard and yes, it might be filled with self-denial and taking up my cross and that doesn't sound attractive, but what we find there is resurrection life. Life in all its fullness. And so we're going to look over these next few weeks and months about tools for discipleship, how to build this life of following Jesus more faithfully together so that we can become a community of radical disciples of Jesus. And just as Jesus is inviting you onto an adventure, I want to do the same thing. Are you up for it? Are you up for building this community? of growing together, following Jesus, chasing after him, seeing what it is that he has promised and actually creating a situation in our lives where he's able to provide for that because we're depending on him. I want to give you the opportunity, whether you're at home or in the room, to pray with me and to offer yourself afresh to God. And I'd like to do that by doing something physical. We can't come to the front. Uh, Lizzie's going to come to the front and share a time of prayer and ministry with me. But if you're watching online or if you're in the room, I'd love to invite you to kneel with me. To offer yourself afresh to the Lord. To say, yeah, I want to be a radical disciple of Jesus and I want to do it with my brothers and sisters here. So let's just kneel if you're comfortable doing that and invite the Holy Spirit to come. And you may have some fear in your heart as you kneel. Like, oh Lord, I'm just not sure I can trust you. I'm not sure I like the idea of self-denial. It sounds way too hard. And we just welcome you, Holy Spirit, into those feelings of fear or anxiety. That it's as we offer ourselves afresh to you that we find fulfillment and peace. In you. And so, in those places where you might more naturally hold back, just offer it afresh to the Lord. Whatever we say yes to is what we worship. And today, Lord, we want our yes to be focused on you. Tomorrow, we want our yes to be focused on you. For our lives, Lord, we want our yes to be focused on you because you gave your life, you gave your yes to us. And so we offer you ours as worship, as a thank you, as a love response to your love and grace. Come, Holy Spirit, we welcome you.